So today, like I said, we're going to turn to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16, and it's going to, you know, the, the main focus of it's going to be verses 21 through 28. But I actually want you to turn back a little bit to verses 13 because I want to show you something in the total scripture that's here. You know, and so I'm going to read 13 through 28, and then I'm going to show you something that I thought was really neat. So we go right here and we look and it says in Matthew chapter 16, verse 13 through 28, it says, When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said, Some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatsoever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he commanded his disciples that they should, not, that they should tell no one that he was Jesus the Christ. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, and suffer many things from the elders, the chief priests, the, and scribes, and be killed and raised the third day. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he, tur he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me, and you are not, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but of the things of man. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it to a man that if he gains the whole world, and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with, the angel, with his angels, and then he will reward each according to his works. Assuredly, I say to you, there are some standing here who shall not taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. So I wanted to read all of that to you because I want you to look at this from a say a, an airplane view a thousand foot view point right and what does this all show you this is one of the parts of the gospel right here this is what Jesus did for us and I want you as you got it open I want you to look right here and go to verse 15 where it says but who do you say that I am you know Simon Peter said you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. So you must know who He is, right? And then what did He do for you? A lot of people, you know, don't see this right here, but right here He says you must know what He did for you. And that was, if you look in verse 21, it says, you know, from that time Jesus began to show His disciples that He must go to Jerusalem, and suffer many things from the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed and raised the third day. Right? And so we see right here in this, this part where we're looking at, he's got to go, you got to know who he is. You got to know what he did for you. Now when we look on down in verse 24, here's our part. Here's our part of this. If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. So you've got to follow Jesus. 
You got to trust in Him. You know, this part of the part of if anyone desires to come after me, you know, it says, but all, you know, if you look in, first, in John chapter 1, verse 12, it says, but all who did receive Him, who believed in His name, He gave the right to become children of God. So just from a thousand foot view, when you look at this, this scripture, all of this that I read to you, I wanted to share that with you. So that was one of the reasons why I wanted to back up a little bit and share that with you, because you see the gospel right here in these verses, right here. You know, when you also, when you look at denying self, when you look at your part, you know, the, you know, and I wanted to emphasize just a little bit before I go to get on our study, you know, it says, if anyone desires to to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. You know, the desire to follow Jesus, you know, becoming his disciple, that's showing that's our, a matter of personal choice if you desire, right? And then denying oneself. So, I, you know, like I said, I had a friend that asked me, what does all that mean? And so uh, this is where I'm, I'm explaining. So to deny oneself, it involves submitting to God's will, you know, repenting. Submit to God's will, seeking to live according to Christ's teachings and examples, right? You know, taking up your cross. What does that mean? That's embracing the difficulties, right? We've got to embrace the difficulties and challenges that come and the potential persecutions that may come with following Jesus and endure the hardships, the suffering and hardships when they come. And then... You know, it's a daily commitment. Follow me, right? When you look at follow me, it's a daily commitment. In the Gospel of Luke, and, I, and we'll go, it says, taking up your cross daily. You know, it says daily. Following Jesus isn't just a one-time event. It's not something that I, oh yeah, I, I trusted Jesus when I was in, in school, you know, when I went to vacation Bible school, and that's all I had to do, and I've never even thought about Him again. You know, there's the there's we're, we're going to explore that a little bit more into this. There's many people that think or many people think, yeah, I know who Jesus is. And it's like cultural Christianity. My mom and my dad are Christians and I've been raised in the church. But, you know, I never seek to follow him. I never seek to, to go after him. I never seek to take up my cross. It's not take up his cross, but take up my cross, take up your cross. And follow him. So that's one of the things I wanted to sh share with y'all about this. You know, sort of a thousand foot view when you look at it. Another thing, when you come down a little bit, you know, before we start in verse 21, I wanted to uh, also show you another viewpoint that happens right here. You know, we look at, at Peter. And one of the things that when we look at Peter, we see Peter go from being... In the Spirit, right? We see him being confessing Jesus as Christ. And it seems to be, and, and I'm not sure if it happened, you know, immediately right there but or, or later. Or maybe, you know, later on in that day or, or within, you know, the next couple of days. But it seems to be that he goes, in that moment, he goes from, you know, being influenced by the devil. Right? So he's influenced by the Father. And it seems like next few moments, he's influenced by Satan. And so a lot of people kind of judge him like, wow, this is Satan. Get behind me, Satan, when Jesus says that. For you're an offense to me. You know, and they, 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 before you start to think bad on Peter in this part right here, and what one of the things that I think the Holy Spirit wants us to know is that that can also, it's very common. I think that happens to, I bet you that's happened to each and every one of us. Each and every one of us. Let me give you a few examples, for instance, right? Have you ever, just think of this, have you ever been maybe praising God, driving down the road, you might be listening to a, a sermon or listening to something or, or listening to praise and worship music or something like that? Or maybe even med just meditating on, on God. And then somebody cuts you off and then you go over and you say all kinds of stuff, getting all mad and upset, you know, ranting at that guy. And that's the, 
a lot of times for many of us, that's the least. I mean, I'm, I'm being generous on that rant. And a lot of times there more stuff slips out of people's mouths, right? But you go from that immediately. Or, or let's take this, for instance. You get to rushing. Got to get to church. We got to get there. And we're, we're getting late. Something happens. And you start fussing at your family and, and, and fussing at this or doing this. And yet at the same time, you're getting ready. You're thinking about things of God. And you know, how many times has that happened? And then you come up in here and here you are. You know, praise God and worship. You know, how many times does that happen to you? Or how about like maybe even after church, right? You go out to eat somewhere. And then the waitress don't even ask you if you want any more tea. Or she doesn't ask you certain things, whatever she isn't serving you as you think. And then you're like... Well, I just, you get all kind of frustrated, right? And you might think things or say things that you shouldn't. You see, one moment you're in God, you're in, you know, right here, praising God. The next moment you're thinking something totally opposite. And so I see that seems to be, even though Peter might have had good intentions, what he was saying, he was still being influenced by Satan, right after being influenced by God. And how fast that can go. I mean, it just can happen just like that. You know, James actually, and we we said this a couple weeks ago, James 3, 9 and 10 actually says, with it, meaning our tongue, we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God, made made just like God. He's in the image of God. Each one of us are in the image of God. And out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. He says, brethren, these things ought not be so. So this is like a 500-foot thing of it. Just look at this and see how fast it can happen. And those are the things that we need to guard on. Now let's go look at uh, verse 21. What, we were going, what we're getting to in our text, verse 21. You know, it says, From this time be, Jesus began to show His disciples that He must go to Jerusalem and that He must suffer many things from the elders, chief priests, scribes, and be killed and raised the third day. You know, when it says right here from this time, Jesus began to show His disciples. This is showing a shift, a change in all the, you know, in the dynamic of what Jesus is doing. He's no longer preaching about the kingdom of heaven and to repent so much, but he's sitting here actually showing what his disciples, what he must do, and that march towards Jerusalem. Six months from now, he would be on the cross. So he's looking. At, we're looking at, at, at that, and he's trying to start to tell his disciples what to expect. You know, He actually, in Matthew, it's repeated five times that he would go to Jerusalem and die. You know, if you look right here in, in, in 16, verse 21, he talks about it. But in 17, 12, he says it about it. And in 17, 22, and 23, and 20, 18, and 19, and, verse 20, and chapter 20, verse 28. If you want to look those up, you can look and you can see hints where he's telling his disciples. You know, and when you go and look in the other gospels, you know, when you look, you see Mark, you know, the the... The parallel to it is in Mark chapter 8, verse 31 and 33, and Luke chapter 21 and 22. But right here, here's some of the things that he was saying. You know, this was the third time right here where, where I'm fixing to read to you. In Mark chapter 10, verses 3 through 34, he says, uh, and this would have been his third time. It says, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be betrayed by the chief priests and the scribes, and they will be condemned. They will condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles. And they will mock him and scourge him and spit on him and kill him. And the third day he will rise again. So we see a little bit more detail. It's going to be violent. It's going to be some, some, some bad stuff. So he's trying to, to get his disciples prepared for this. You know, another thing right here, when you look in Luke, Luke's version of that, that third time that they took him, he says Jesus took the 12 aside and told them and said, Behold, 
the exact same thing. He says, Behold, we are going to Jerusalem, and all things are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man. See, he was telling them that it was not only was he telling them that the, the prophets had. And so that's your clue. Not only it was for, for Peter and, and, and them, for them to go back into the Scriptures and look for these parts. Right? And that's for everybody's clue. To look for these parts that he was telling them. But then, and that he would be delivered up to the Gentiles. And he'll be mocked and, and insulted and spit upon. And they'll scourge him and kill him. And the third day he will rise again. You know, one of the things that happens a lot of times when we see this and we see Peter's reaction to what he did and, and stuff that we'll see later on. One of the things you need to look at, it says right here, if you follow the rest of that verse, then this was Luke chapter 18, verses 31 and 33. If you look at 34, verse 34, he says, but, you know, talking about his disciples, but they understood none of these things. This saying was hidden from them, and they did not know the things which were spoken. You know, he's telling them, though Jesus is telling them, to go look into the Word. Look at the Word. He says these things were, uh, were, by the, they were, they were written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man. And then later on you see they didn't know Him. So he's encouraging them to look into those Scriptures. And that's the same thing that's happening with us today. We're encouraged to not just take my word for it, but look into those scriptures to see if those things are so. Right? And one of the things that he was trying to show them that they didn't understand was what his mission was. You know, if you look in Matthew 20, verse 28, it says, Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served. See, they thought he should come to be served. He is the king, right? He was the Messiah, the king, the one to save him. He was going to be the king of Israel. He was going to destroy all his enemies. It says that in the Old Testament too, right? But they didn't realize that he had, they didn't, they, they, they must have missed over the part where he'd be like a worm, right? Rejected. And so, you know, they sit there and didn't see that. But Jesus sit there, you know, in this saying, he said, but to serve. He didn't come to be served at this time. He come to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. So he if you if you look back in there you'll see those scriptures. You know, then we see right here in verse 22, six, you know, back to Matthew chapter 16 verse 22. He says that Peter took him aside and began to re rebuke him saying, "Far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. Right? Right here, Peter's demonstrating his lack of knowledge that we were just talking about. They didn't understand those things. They didn't understand his mission, that he must suffer and die on the cross, right? They didn't know it for us, for our sakes. You know, but now, you know, and one of the things that I wanted to say a little bit more about that is they didn't understand that it took him, it took our Lord, to be the one to do the work. You know, later on we'll see that. But all the way from the beginning, you remember when Adam and Eve suffered in the garden? They put, they did their own work, which put fig leaves around them, right? But guess what? God's the one that actually did the work. He's the one that took the lamb and made the clothes of garments for them. He did the work. And the same thing He did then, He's got to do for us to clothe us now. We're clothed in His blood. So that's one of the things. But let's see what Peter, later on he understood. Later on he saw this. You know, I, I got to look in him. Peter, you know, in the actual book, his books, and I'm sure there's many other places, but 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18 through 21 says that knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold for your aimless conduct conduct received by the traditions of your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last three time, three time, these last times for you who through him believe in God 
who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your so that your faith and hope are in God. So you see right here one of the things he says Christ as the lamb. See he's Jesus, I mean Peter, so excuse me. Peter sat there and saw that too. Peter saw that from the beginning it was foreordained. That was the whole thing. When Adam and Eve sinned, Jesus was that lamb that was slain. That work was done by the by God, but he was also a shadow of him being that lamb who was slain. You know, we also see Peter says in in chapter 2, verse 24, it says, who himself bore our sins on his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sin, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. You know, and we look again in in 1 Peter, we look again he's in chapter 3, he says, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. See, I think Peter had come to understand later on, but at this time, he says, Lord, far be it from you, right? This shall not happen to you. See, another thing that goes on right here, and, and as we look, as we look a little bit more, and, and maybe I, I don't want to get ahead. Let me get, let me get, let me, let me back up and go where I want. So right here in that verse where it says that, then we look at right here, next thing Jesus says. He says, verse 23, we look at verse 23. He says, but he turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me, for you are not merciful of the things of God but of the things of men, right? So Jesus immediately, as Peter sat there and said, far be it from you, it's almost like Jesus probably stopped him. Stop, mid sentence. Get behind me, Satan. You're an offense to me. For you're not mindful of the things of God, but of the things of men. That's the way I, I picture it. That that's what Jesus, almost like he stopped him right there. Cut him off. Here's Jesus going to come and rebuke him. Right? It's gonna come, and Peter's going to come and rebuke Jesus. And he just said he was the, the, the Christ, the Son of the living God. You know, Peter might have meant well. You know, when we look at it, Peter might have meant well with his words, right? His words reflect, though, the human part of it, right? The human perspective to avoid the suffering. You know, you ain't got to go to the cross. You ain't got to do that. And one of the things I was sitting there wanting to say, you know, just think if Jesus wouldn't have went to that cross. What if Jesus would have said, you know, you're right, Peter. I don't have to go to the cross. Then we are all condemned. You know, and when he sits there and he says, get behind me, Satan. If you actually think about it, it's the same thing Satan said. And, and when he was tempting Jesus in the wilderness, what did he say? He said, if you'll bow down to me, just do this one little thing, right? This one small part, just bow down and worship me. I'll give you all these kingdoms. You can be the king and you don't have to go to the cross. See, he was tempting Jesus' flesh right there. He was tempting, I mean, you know, trying to allure to the flesh. And so when we look right here, when he says, get behind me, Satan, do you not think Jesus would have recognized that right then? You don't have to. Just throw yourself off this temple. You'll be right in front of the people and the people will see that you're God. You won't, have, you won't even get hurt. It says you won't dash your foot against a song. Right? And, 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 but that's not... Or take this bread. You don't have to do that. So you don't have to suffer... We can do this without the suffering. And that's what Peter was sitting there saying. But that's the things of man. Man doesn't want to suffer. You know, I was sitting there saying earlier, a lot of times when we suffer and go through things, let's look through what Jesus would have for us. You know, let's look and see, you know, those things that, that where they're leading to good. Because with Christ's suffering, we gained the whole world. 
You know, we became, we were able to be saved. Without Christ's suffering, would it never happen? And you look at those things and you look at it at the time being it, as it's happening, you wouldn't think that would be the greatest thing in the world. Can you imagine what the disciples would have seen when they saw Jesus up there being crucified? They've been following him. Why do you think they ran into the, the, the back end of the room and locked the doors and hid? They were fearful. It wasn't until that resurrection that they had the power again. They realized, hey, Jesus is real. He's, he's, he's not just dead. He rose again. So just like Satan was trying to divert his mission that Jesus had, Peter was doing a lot the same right there. Didn't realize it though. And sometimes that, that goes another thing to say. Sometimes things that we may think are good aren't always good. Remember the part where it says, spare the rod and spoil the child? How many times have you had to whoop your child? And it's, it, it hurts you to do it. It hurts you worse than it hurts the child. But you know what the consequences of it. So not everything, you know, that, that, that is, just keep that in mind. So also the, the right there when he calls him Satan, he's saying adversary. The word for the strong and the strongs is uh, adversary, one who opposes the purpose or act, right? It's also the name given to Satan, but it's also that word has the meaning, which is, the, the adversary, adversary. Then we look at uh, Matthew chapter 16, verses 24, right? Look at verse 24. It says, Jesus said to his disciples, right then he says, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Now, you see right there where Jesus is talking about the cross right there, right? And one of the things I want you to think about as we reflect on this, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. I want you to go to the parable of the sower. I want you to turn back a little bit in uh, Matthew chapter to Matthew chapter 13. And, and go to verses 10 right here because I want to show you something and show you some some some. Not parallels, but opposites, I guess. And so when we look back in Matthew chapter 13, you know, we see it, the purpose right here, especially verses 10 and 14. He, Jesus has discussed the parable of the sower, right? And then he tells, you know, his disciples come to him and say, you know, uh, you know come to him in verse 10. They says, and his disciples came to him and said, why do you speak to them in parables, Right? And he answered and said to them, Because it is given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. For whatsoever, whosoever has to, has to him more will be given, and, who's, and he will have abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. Therefore, I speak unto you these parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear nor do they understand. And in them the prophecy of Isaiah is filled, which says, and this is where I want you to go back. You know, when we're talking about if any man desires to come after me, right? The desire to follow Jesus, right? That desire. You know, Jesus addresses it, becomes, you know, it, it's, a, it's a desire to follow, indicating his disciples it would be a personal choice, right? So when we look at this, Isaiah prophecy, we look at what it says. Hearing you will hear and shall not understand. And seeing you will see and not perceive. For the hearts of this people grow dull and their ears are hard of hearing and their eyes they have closed. Least they should op see with their eyes and hear with their ears. Least they should understand with their hearts in turn, so that I should heal them. Now, I want you to look at this one part right here in Matthew. When you look right here, and it's, it's right here in verse 15, it says, their ears are hard of hearing, right? And their eyes, 
they have closed. Who has closed their eyes? The people. It was their choice. They're the ones that closed and shut their eyes on what it was. Right? And so when you see this, if anybody desires to come after me, you have to open your eyes and look. That's why Peter, we looked right here earlier, we see that in Luke, it was sitting there saying that where the Scriptures were, and they still didn't understand it. So you have to have a desire. You have to look these things out. You know, it's not just, you know, you're going to hear it and go on. Because, you know, that's one of the... One of the uh, things you just don't hear it and go on and say i'm a christian but anyways when it says denying then we go to this part where it says let him deny himself right so denying oneself is to follow like i said to follow jesus one must deny you know one must deny himself and deny to, is not to deny stuff you know it's not to deny your stuff and this is but it's that your this isn't about your life this is about his life Right? It's submitting to God's will and seeking accordance to His teachings. Now, we look in this same parable up here when we was looking at the parable. And I want you to go down to verse 22. See if you see the opposite right here when you look in verse 22. And it says, Now he who receives the seed among the thorns is he who hears the word, and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becomes unfruitful do you not see him sitting there basically a parallel what he's saying or not necessarily a parallel but the you know opposite he's trying to teach he's trying to tell you he's saying you know you must deny yourself that means don't let the cares of this world right don't let them distract you from me don't let the cares of these words don't let the riches choke you out right don't let that's a deceitful thing. That doesn't help you in those things. It may be for a temporary, for a moment, but it's not forever. You know, and then we look at uh, taking up your cross. Let's see where it says in taking up your cross. That's embracing difficulties, right? When you sit there, challenges and potential persecutions that may come with following Jesus. You're willing to endure suffering and hardship that arises from being faithful to Him, right? And so let's look in verses 22. Go up just a little bit. You look in 20 and, 21 and, uh, 20 and 21. It says, This is the one, but he who receives the seed on the stony places, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. But he has no root in himself, but endures for a while. For when tribulations... And persecutions arise because of the Word, because of Jesus. Because who is the Word? It's Jesus. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with Him. Right? So when you, they start, they immediately, they stumble. Do you see the connection there? He's teaching us this even more. And then He says, follow me. You know, follow me is stated, you know, you know that follow me. It's stated in the Gospel of Luke is taking up the cross daily is a daily commitment. Following Jesus is not a one-time event, but an ongoing journey. You know, a one-time event, you know, a person who sits there and he receives the Word with joy and is happy about it all of a sudden. But then when something happens, like, man, I ain't going to really do that, but I'm still a Christian. Keeps on walking, keeps on walking, doing his thing. Right? But he never really comes back to Christ ever again. That's not, he says, follow me. When you follow somebody, you're following them. You follow them. You stay with them. You don't just follow them for two seconds and that's you're still following them. No, he says, follow me. That's an ongoing thing, right? It's an ongoing. And we, we need to ongoing, you know, continue to go on that journey with Christ. And, and like it said in Luke chapter 9, verse 23, you know, he said to them, if... Anyone desires to come after me, which is the same thing he's saying up here. Let him deny himself and take up his cross daily, daily, and follow me. So that's taking up your cross daily. You're, you're suffering those, those things. Daily we have things, but we're still following him continually. You know, 
So just a comparison right here of what he's saying in this verse, you know, in these verses. You know, to deny yourself or you can live for yourself. You can take up your cross or you can ignore the cross. You can follow Christ or you can follow the world. You can lose your life for his sake or you can save your life for your own sake. You can forsake the world or you can gain the world. You can keep your soul or you can lose your soul. And you can share his glory, his reward in glory or you can lose his reward in glory. You know, Paul sits there and says it like this. He says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is a reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is good and acceptable in the perfect will of God. See, he's wanting you to be in his will. He's wanting you to be in the perfect will to renew and to transform your life. Follow him. You know, he says also in Galatians, Paul says there, and he says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I live now in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. See, he gave himself as a ransom. So now when we look at uh, verses 25 and 26, and I'm going to break this down. It says, For whosoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whosoever loses his life for my sake will find it. You know, one of the things that Jesus even expounds on that later on at 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 really talking about the end of the days, right? If you look in Luke chapter 17, verses 31 and 30, 30, 31 through 33, he says, In that day, he who is on the housetop, he and his goods are in the house, let him not come down and take them away. And likewise, anyone who is in the field, let them not turn back. And then he says, Remember Lot's wife. And then he says, whoever seeks to save his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life will preserve it. You know, think about that. He's telling you right there, this right here, this, this, you know, whoever will lose his life. Always be ready with Christ. You know, we look at a lot of things. We think, you know, every day we're saying the Lord's going to come. The Lord's going to come, you know, and he could come to this day or this week or next week or whenever, but we're feeling like it's really soon, you know. But he's right here telling you, you better be ready all the time. All the time. And, and as I was reading this through this morning, I was thinking about when I say you better be ready all the time. I had a, 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 a friend I knew at work. He's sitting there one day after work, now, he worked in a different area, but he comes up there and they, they, they said what he did was he, he walked out, was walking out of, uh, out of work. He stopped by and there used to have a cashier lady where you could buy a Coke and you can get candy. Now you can do it, but you just got to scan your, your card, right? But at that time, you had to get, give the money to the cashier lady. And he sat there and he gave the money, got the Coke, started to open it up or something like that, turned around. And he fell flat on his face. He died of a massive heart attack right there. He went to go see the Lord Jesus right then, right there. I had another friend that I saw the day before going through the turnstile where he was, and he was one of my maintenance guys that came in and did maintenance. I was on a third shift, and he was doing a constant third shift. The next day, when I come to find out, is that night as he sat in that in his office, in his little area where the maintenance guys sit, he had a massive heart attack and died. So, Jesus right here, if you desire to save your life, you know, 
You know, you'll lose it, but whoever loses it. Now, he's sitting there also saying, you know, this part right here when I'm talking about, you know, he was talking about in Luke. But he said, remember Lot's wife. You remember Lot's wife? Uh, what the story was with Lot? You know, he went to go and, and pull Lot out of Sodom and Gomorrah. But she sat there and looked back at the world. She remembered her the, the things of the world that was going on. Right? And she looked back and she turned to a pillar of salt. She lost her life because she desired to save her life that she had in Sodom. She lost it right there. And that's the need for us to consistently be ready to focus on things of God, not things of the world. Be ready to meet Him at any moment because it could come. You know, uh, the next right here, when we look at verse 26, for what profit is it to a man that he gained the world and lose his own soul? Or what will, well, let's just stop right there. What profit is it for a man to gain the world and lose his own whole soul? So one of the things I got to think in, one example that, that is given to us in this scripture is Solomon. He sits there and goes in Ecclesiastes. If you look in verse now, it's, it's, it would be good for you to read all of Ecclesiastes if you can and see some of those comparisons of what we're talking about. But right here, he's sitting here talking about the, uh, you know, uh, talking about gaining the world. Solomon's talking about gaining the world, right? And so what he says. In Ecclesiastes 2, 9 and 11, he says, So I became great and excelled more than all those who were before me in Jerusalem. Also, my wisdom remained with me. Whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I did not withhold my heart from any pleasure, for my, for my heart rejoiced in all my labor. And this is my reward for all my labor. Then when I looked on the works of my hands that I had done and on the labor which I had toiled, and indeed it was vanity and gasping at the wind, and there was no profit under the sun. Have you ever tried to grab the wind? You ever stuck your hand out the car window and tried to grab it? It may feel good for a minute, right? Blowing that air on you or whatever but guess what you can't hold it it's gone as soon as it's over the wind i've had cool breezes come by and it's there for a minute feels good but it's gone after it's gone and it's hot and miserable you know a lot of times we look outside at the uh go outside in the heat and it's so hot and you know that cool breeze when it comes by every once in a while it's great but it's 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 gone real quick so what would, it says, for what profit would, it, would a man gain if he gains the whole world? This world is going to be gone one of these days. It's going, to be, it's going to be gone. And all you're going to have, it says, you know, one of the parts in Revelations, it says the whole world, right? Everything was fled away and there was nothing where man could hide at that time and they had to go and stand before him, right? And so... You know, there's nowhere for him to hide. And what good does it do? He loses his own soul. You know, all these riches, he profits and gains the whole world, but he loses his own soul. You know, what Solomon said that that was nothing. There's nothing in that. It says there's no profit under the sun for it. And then I looked at this next part. It says, or what will man give in exchange? And then that took me straight to thinking about Revelations. And it's meant to thinking about, you know, Revelation where it's 3, chapter 13, verse 16 and 17, where he sits there and he says he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hands or on their forehead. And that no man may buy or sell except the one who has the mark of the name of the beast or the number of, of his name. You know, when you look down the next chapter, it says, verse 9, he says, then a then the third angel followed and said in a loud voice, the people are going to hear this. They're going to know. Don't take that mark, right? 
he's saying that angel's going to go around. He says, and if anyone worships a beast or his image or receives the mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out in full strength onto the cup of, indig of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone with, in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever. And they shall have no rest day or night who worship the beast and, and his image and who receive the mark on his name. Mark receives the mark of his name. You know, when you look at that, what would you exchange? There's going to come a time when people are going to have to exchange that. They're going to exchange it for a little bit of bread, a little bit of food, can't buy or sell. You better be willing to give it all up for Him. That's what He's saying. To give it up for Him. You know, don't take those things. Now, Christ doesn't do those things all the time. He's right now, He's giving you freely to sit there and accept Him. Easily. But at that time, you're going, you know, you deny that mark. That's one of the things you're going to have to deny that mark and still trust Him what you're supposed to do today. It's not going to be just deny the mark because I'm sure there's going to be many that's going to be not saved, not trust, but they won't take that mark. Right? And those people are going to go on to hell. You know, go on and be there. And then He's going to take those that did trust Him. You know, Jesus actually sits there and says not to lay up your treasures in heaven. You know, lay them up in, on this earth where moth and rust will destroy them. And thieves can break in and steal them. He says, don't, don't, don't put your treasures in this world, but put your treasures in heaven. You know, you want to invest in something? Invest in heavenly things. You know, every time, you know, we do something and talk to somebody about the Lord, we're investing in heavenly things. That's why I put, I brought us some more gospel tracks that if y'all want to take one, take it and put it on there and I'll bring some more. You know, they're a different, different one from the last time. But take them and put them out. It doesn't take much to set them somewhere, set them in a book, put them in as a bookmarker when you're in there looking at a book in a magazine case. A bookmarker in there. You never know who's going to open it up and how God's going to use that. Or set them on a shelf or give them leave them with a tip you know when you leave to, now leave a good tip for your waitress <laughs> you know don't leave them a bad tip and leave them a gospel trap but you know but you know there, there's things do those things lay up your treasures in heaven not on earth don't exchange this stuff because this is going to all vanish and then he says verse 27 says for the son of man will come in His glory of His Father and of the, of the angels, right? So I wanted to, to, to read this one part. And, you know, a lot of times we look at this glory, you know. So when we look at that glory, a lot of times the, it's called the Shekinah glory. And that Shekinah glory is a cloud, right? Is the cloud. And it says He's going to be coming back on the clouds. That Shekinah glory in that cloud. Let me uh, read to you what a guy named Arnold Frutenbaum said. He said, the second coming of the Christ of Messiah, with the, with the second coming of the Christ, there will be a manifestation of the Shekinah glory in His visible and physical appearance. In Matthew 26, as it reads, For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of His Father and of His angels, and then they shall render unto man according to His deeds. The point of this passage is that the Son of Man will come in the glory of His Father. Just as in John 1, 14, men were able to behold the glory of the Father at the first coming, it is the same glory of the Father that Jesus will return, and, soon, and it will be seen by men again. Another passage relating to this Shekinah glory of God is in the second coming when we read in Matthew chapter 24. And it shall, and he, and then he, then shall appear a sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and they shall, should, then shall all the tribes of the, of the earth mourn. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven 
with power and great glory. According to this passage, just prior to the second coming, the signs of the Son of Man appearing in the heaven, and that sign will certainly be the Shekinah glory, for the Son of God will come in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And you can read that also in Mark and Luke. But that's something, you know, there was a, you know, another part up here where it was talking about that Shekinah glory being in the temple, right? And in the, in the temple that, that, so. Anyways, that, that's something to look at on that where it says, for the Son of Man shall come in His glory. Because He's going to come back. And then it says, and then He will reward each according to His works. Now, I wanted you, you know, this each according to this works applies to us and sinners. You know, people, well, not just sinners, but we're all sinners, but saved and unsaved, right? So I was looking at what, what is the works of, uh, what, you know, let me read this. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. So what do you do if you do get wages? You have to do a work, right? And so that's sin. And then it says you're a slave to sin, correct? So you can't even, a lot of times when you, when you sin and, you, and people say, well, I like to sin. Well, it's because they're a slave to it, right? They're a slave to that sin. And that sin, that wage for that is going to be death. Without, without Christ. You know, the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. Now, one of the things I want you to realize this. It's not by works that you get to heaven. Paul says there, and I want to emphasize this. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2, 8, verse 10, it says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, that, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any of you should boast. For we are His workmanship. It's His works. Back again, just like it was in the garden. Jesus is the one that clothed them. They tried to clothe themselves and that didn't work. Jesus is the one that clothed them. It says, For His work, you are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. See, you're going to do those good works for Christ because He's going to cause you. It says, in which God prepared beforehand that you should walk in those good works. So those works that you do, those things when you set out a gospel track or you share the gospel or you talk to somebody or whatever it is you're doing, feeding the poor, whatever it is that you're doing for Christ and you do for His and in your heart, God knows He's going to give you that. That's that, that, that too. He's going to give you that reward for each according to His works. So just not your works as far as salvation comes. You can't work for your salvation. But He's going to make you walk in those works once you become His. And then the last part right here, it says in Matthew chapter 16, verse 28, we look at it, it says, Assuredly I say unto you, there are some standing here that shall not taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in His kingdom. You know, again, Peter talks about this. I believe it needs to actually go more in chapter 17 because we'll learn about that next week. More about that, you know. And that is the transfiguration. He goes on the mount. Now, to show you that it talks about that, he's talking about the transfiguration and seeing him right we'll look at second peter chapter 1 16 through 18 it says for we did not cunningly devise fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our lord jesus christ but were eyewitnesses of his majesty for he received from god the father honor and glory when such a voice came to him from excellent glory. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And when and we heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. And we'll read about that more next next week. We'll learn more about that. If if we're still here, we could be gone. So never know. But you know, another thing 
you know, until next week, we'll get to that. But another thing you can look at right here, another person that, that gazed up, and that was Stephen the martyr. You know, he saw that. He wouldn't have been with them at that time, I don't think. It doesn't mention it. I don't know for sure. Could have. But it says, you know, when right there when he was preaching and then, you know, they were, they were uh, upset at him, all the people around him, they were upset at him. They were mad, gnashing their teeth. You know, but right before they took him out of, of the city and killed him, he sat there and he said, in verse 55, this is Acts chapter 7, verses 54 through 60, if you want to read that part. It goes a little bit further than that, but if you want to look in verse 55, it says, But he, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed up into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of, the God, of, the, of God. And and said, Look, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. So it's like a portal or a rift or whatever you would like to call it. But he saw that right before he died, before they dragged him out and stoned him. They, in fact, those people, they didn't, they shut their ears up. It says the, the, the people they heard him, they shut their ears. Here they are making a decision again, like we learned earlier. They desire to come follow after me, right? So I hope each and every person desires to follow after Him. And you know, when that old rugged cross, take up that cross and follow after Him. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we love You today and we just praise You. Lord, we ask that this Word goes out to all the hearts and minds, Lord, and that You use it to change People, Lord, that you use it to bring them closer to you or use it to be for them to be saved, Lord. We ask that. Anybody who's not saved, now's the time, Lord, for them to be saved. Now's the time for them to get draw closer to you. Lord, it could be too late. And you never know when it's around the corner. You know, it could happen now, at this second. So, Lord, may anybody, if they not hear in your they hear this word and they don't know you, Lord, that they would come to you and know you. Lord, we love you, and we thank you for your word, and we thank you for everything you've done. In Jesus' holy name, amen.